This presentation is being recorded and you are currently in listen-only mode. Now, without any further delay, I would like to turn today's meeting over to our presenter, Eric Landis. Eric, you now have the floor. Thanks, Dana. You're welcome. Um, thanks. I'm going to go ahead and share and get to my PowerPoint started. Hi, everybody. And welcome. Hopefully, you all can see that now. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Eric Landis. I work uh, with Agile Thought, a consulting company out of Tampa, Florida, and really a nationwide company. Today, we're going to uh, go over client side intelligent design, really, how to use client side test driven design or, or test driven development tools like QUnit and Jasmine, and I'm going to show you how to integrate them with. ALM. So you've heard of test-driven development. Uh, it's it's turned into test-driven design. Back in the 90s, the, the folks uh, started Agile, started doing things like test-driven, you know, started writing code with tests. And we're going to talk about how we can use that in this new world of HTML5 with JavaScript and, and, and help you to have more maintainable code, especially on the JavaScript side. So real quick, a little bit about me. I'm a technical architect for Agile Thought. Uh, been involved with the IT industry for close to 20 years and um, currently doing a lot of ALM work with TFS, mainly with TFS and uh, the Microsoft stack. So uh, to kind of go over our agenda today, first I'm going to give you an overview of test-driven development, where, where this is coming out of, or test-driven design, as we talked about it, and shall tell you how we can practice that. Then we're going to go over why JavaScript testing is different than TDD in the different, uh, different environments. Then we'll be doing some demos of how using QUnit and, and setting that up in Visual Studio. Finally, talk a little bit about what makes a good test and, and how you can have testing goodness in your in your different um, tests, whether it's Q, you're doing JavaScript or C-sharp, uh, you can use those uh, the good test principles to go, go transcend those kinds of um, testing principles. And finally, we're going to talk about how we can integrate these unit tests into an ALM, and I'll be demoing TFS and give you a few hints on how maybe you could do it in Jenkins as well. Uh, but mainly showing off uh, TFS 2012 and how you can integrate it into So let's get started and really talk about test-driven development and why that's important. So let, let's talk about, you know, developers testing. A lot of times, most of, a lot of developers I work with, uh, they're very reluctant to start automated testing. And they just want to code, you know, and... and start coding and get the code done and i'm sure it'll be good back in the nine you know back in the late 90s early 2000s when test room development started there there was a lot of reasons to start your your coding with a test and and kent back and some other folks really took this to task uh, and I highly recommend that book. Ken Beck has a book on test driven development. If you haven't read it yet, it's test driven, uh, test driven development by example. So he kind of started this whole test driven movement, and um, along with some of the other XP folks so like Ron Jeffries. And to be a good developer, really, it's um, nowadays uh, something that you need to have in your testing toolkit in, in your development toolkit so if you talk if, if you go to any of the software craftsmanship movements I have been to meetings with uh, Uncle Bob Martin who's another name that's out there they really emphasize test room development and I've even heard Uncle Bob say if, if you consider yourself a professional development you developer you should be we, we assume you're doing test driven development or TDD so, so again, these are some good reasons why we want to bring this TDD attitude to the, to the client side. And, and, to, and we'll talk a little bit about 
why do we call it test-driven design? So what happened, um, the Agile folks really thought about using test-driven development as a way to maintain your application and to also ensure that you're meeting you know the the, the requests of the, the the stakeholders or product owners depending on how you're doing your development uh, what what happened is they found as we got to more complex applications and developing more complex software we started talking about using tests to actually drive the design of our code or the architecture of our code. And so uh, you heard terms like emergent architecture come out, uh, out of this movement, out of the agile movement, which emphasizes having some architecture, but really not doing big design up front, but rather designing as you go and designing what you need. And if test-driven development and test-driven design it really helps you to design that architecture and design your application in a way that's maintainable and scalable. Um, and by using tests first, you keep your code coverage high and you keep it high immediately. So code coverage, we'll talk a little bit about code metrics a little bit later, but that's a metric that's a basic one that you want to get a hold of with your team and make sure that your team has a decent level of code coverage uh, and, and back in the day, uh, this was, you know, happening with Java shops, C Sharp shops have all those tools as well. And we can tell pretty easily what our code coverage is using tools um, like NCover, Visual Studio, of course, has some, the 2012 has some very nice tools to show you what your code coverage is. So if we start in the beginning with test-driven design, you can do a lot of things because your, your tests will always help you in maintaining your application. So with test-driven design, we start with our test, then we iterate, and then we refactor. So for example, uh, let's say I'm doing a, a system that's, and anyway, this is kind of a simple example, but I think it's one that really should help you understand what we mean by uh, starting with the test. So let's say we're writing an application to keep score of a bowling game. So I think most people understand bowling and uh, probably have a grasp, or some kind of grasp of how we score when we bowl. So again, this is a good way to introduce you to uh, test how you do test-driven development and test-driven design. So if we start with our test on a bowling game, uh, scoring, bowling scoring, what we want to do is create a test that will, um, we know there's a frame, and within a frame you bowl twice. So we want to ensure that if we bowl twice, that our program actually gives us an accurate score. So what we'll do is we'll start with a test, let's say a test that says I roll a 0 and a 1 in the first frame, and then we will ensure that our score is one and then we'll start we'll go with two and then um, so in the next frame we'll go or, or one frame we'll bolt a one and a one that should add up to two for the frame and then we'll start doing tests uh, we'introduce tests for spares we'll introduce tests for um, for strikes and, and that introduces some complex logic so as you keep going you keep creating tests for those, and when a test breaks, that's a signal for you to refactor your, your code. So you're iterating, refactoring, and, and doing some design. My first uh, application that we worked on, as a matter of fact, in this manner, we started out doing TDD. Um, we were probably halfway through our, our application when the, the product owner came through uh, and, and mentioned that one of our assumptions on the architecture in the, in the data stack was a little flawed and, and it made a major architectural change. And so for our team, we, we were a little dismayed because that really impacted our code and we were afraid it was going to take us a month to, to refactor everything. Well, since we had very high code coverage, probably in the 90 percentile, and, and a lot of tests, we were able to refactor within a week. So. Um, Using this test driven design, we actually were able to re-architect and redesign our application 
uh, to a newer specification that was fairly different and still quickly um, come back and, and we were assured that the application was still working a lot of the other uh, really uh, complex business logic was still in there. So again, uh, when you're doing test-driven design, you start with the test. You don't start coding your objects. You don't start coding, um, you know, anything else or, or your UI. You start creating a test, and you keep iterating and refactor. And, and the idea is you, you're fastly you're creating your application in, in a quick manner, so you aren't spending a lot of time thinking about how to design. As a matter of fact, you're spending less time uh, actually doing it and doing your code. So I'm sure you're saying, hey, Eric, that's all well and good. That sounds like really like an awesome way to, to code. But how can my teams get good? We've, we've never done this before. So there's, there's a practice out there called coding katas. And a coding kata, actually, based on uh, katas that you may have heard of in the martial arts world, it's an idea of practicing and practicing software development. So, so with that idea of practice software development, uh, you can have a team do a coding kata uh, maybe once a week or, or once 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 a day. Even I've had teams that uh, thirty you know thirty minutes a day they spend coding an application, uh, and it's a small application. For instance, a bowling game, and uh, they create it and go through, create some scoring, get as far as they can in that amount of time, and when they're done, they throw it away. It's, it's not uh, an application that you're going to use because we're practicing. So as people practice um, for other disciplines in software, this is one good way to get better at your craft. So I highly recommend folks to, to look into doing something like a coding kata with your team and, and see how um, you might actually uh, benefit from your team learning how to do this. And, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, one way I do recommend when you start out is to uh, have somebody show people how you're doing the test driven development and the whole, the whole uh, group follows that. And uh, they, they kind of mimic what's going on. Uh, you have a projector showing how for the for this and, and I'll demonstrate that to you in a, in a minute here and then at some point you switch out the people who are showing it so that different people show how they would do the design because obviously the way you code may be a little different between people so hey since uh, <clears throat> since I mentioned that let's practice how you might do a coding kata in C sharp and then uh, this is something you can transfer and use as we talk about the using QUnit and Jasmine and the JavaScript world. But let's get a basis for how you might do a coding kata in a standard language like C Sharp. So I'm going to uh, show you my application. I've got a, an application called Bowling Kata. And within that, I have a project, Bowling Kata Tests. Uh, you know, I'm using the Microsoft Visual Studio MS Test. If you prefer N unit or X unit, you can use those as well to, for for your unit testing framework. But what I'm doing, and and I'm giving you an example since this is a little shortened. Uh, I've got some code up here to show you. But actually, as I mentioned, you would start out with a clean new project, a clean new test project with just this one. If you can see over on the left, just that one project called tests, and you would start building. Uh, your objects, etc., as you build the tests. So, for instance, if you look at my first method, we have uh, roll one, and what we're saying is, if I roll a one, my score, what's my score, and we want to make sure that passes. So, obviously, you can see I have some past tests on the on the right. So, in the bowling kata, we would start out, we would write roll one, we would create something called game and you just type in game and it wouldn't be created at first uh, and then you'd have to create that in, in a standard true bowling kind of way uh, and then you'd uh, come up with some methods in this case I've come up with a method called roll which stores what we've rolled and, and does some 
things in the background. And again, when we test, we, we would do the same thing. So let, let me show you how we might do that. So my next, my next method is going to be a test method. And we're going to call that. Sorry about that. Just type that. We're going to call that public uh, role. I'm pretty sure two is going to work, so I'm going to test rule three. If I have some confidence there. I'm going to go for the gold and rule three. Now, I could copy and paste. You know, it's up to you, but just to kind of give you a feel for how we're practicing, I'm going to say game, and we're going to call it the same thing, curving equals new. And so I'm creating a new object called game. And we know that has some of the stuff I want. And I'm really going to, I'm going to roll a one. Roll a two. And then I'm pretty sure. And obviously within uh, Visual Studio, I can just run the test right here, Visual Studio 2012. So I right click with tests, say run tests. And now we see, hey, my roll three passed. Awesome. But let's say I'm now doing the spare method. Now this is, you know, I want to test if a spare would work. So without going in and modifying the code as I think it should be modified, I'm going to write the test first. So we do public void rule spare. And so I'm going to cheat a little here. I'm going to copy some of this. But I'm going to say roll a one, and I'm going to roll a nine. So the score should be 10. So I'm going to search there. And then I'm going to try something else. I'm going to, I'm going to roll a two. And now, if I have my rules correct in, uh, in bowling, My current score should be 14 because we take that two, it goes back in the, the, the previous frame. So that means my score in the previous frame was actually 12 and I'm going to add two to that 12 and that would give me 14. Now bear with me. I mean, you, you, any bowling purist among you might say I have to finish uh, my role, but uh, see what happens. So my expectation is I'm going to fail on this because I haven't coded yet for the uh, spare. So we see that the test has failed. Let's look at the message, my error list. Here. Go, the assert failed. So it looks like, like, let's open the test. Here we go. Here it is. So we know that failed, and if we were going to continue on here, we'd actually go into the current game, we'd add some code there, and we'd keep running this until we pass. And then we would check that all the other ones passed as well before when we made changes. So that's what you would do in a, in a kata uh, with C Sharp, and, and again, we'll do that with QUnit as well. You can do that. I, I won't do a, a kata game um, with JavaScript, but it's the same principle. When you see QUnit, etc., and how that works, you can do the same thing there. Awesome. So, so now we've practiced. So let's, let's delve into tester and design and the client side design, the client side intelligent design I mentioned. Why is JavaScript different than C Sharp? Well, for those of you working in that space with HTML5, and if you're doing any extensive coding with JavaScript, it doesn't compile. So that, that's uh, a big disadvantage 
really for uh, more enterprise shops. You know, if, if it doesn't compile, I can't quickly tell that the JavaScript file I wrote is um, is is not ready to go out, is not ready to be deployed. I actually have to deploy it, run it in a window, uh, run it in, an, in, in my uh, browser, and see if it fails there, and then do some very tedious debugging sometimes. Now, now the tools are getting better, but uh, JavaScript still lags C Sharp and Java in that respect. Um, test driven development also, you know, starting back in the 90s, we were talking about object oriented design or object oriented uh, de design, object oriented programming. So we were separating things like your business layer from your UI, you're separating your data store from your business logic, and, and keeping everything. Um, in a nice little layer. So since TDD helped clarify that, the separation of client and business logic, JavaScript is a little different animal and is a little confusing sometimes because if we could easily put your JavaScript, and that's the way it started, into our HTML pages. And so while you can separate it, and, and most people are doing that now, that, that to me that's a little mind shift um, in looking at JavaScript and how do we separate, how do we keep those business object separation from our um, UI design. So on the client tier, how, how do we handle business logic? Well, we should handle it uh, very similar to C Sharp, and we'll, and we'll look at that later, or Java, whatever your flavor of development is. Uh, you, you should definitely have a business logic layer and uh, separate everything in JavaScript just like you would in, in any other uh, application. And we'll kind of show you how we do that as kind of a side note of how we're implementing QDNet and Jasmine. So as I said, you know, excuse me, JavaScript is different. You know, we're testing on web pages. Uh, so a lot of times, as I said, you're going to either deploy or locally, you're going to write some JavaScript, bring up a web page, and see if it works with your web page. At least that's the old way of doing it. Now in um, Visual Studio, we have some checking there. So you can check, the, check, you can do some checking whether the JavaScript syntax is correct. So you can use something like JSLint or something like that, that that will help you at least make sure there's no, you know, fat finger type errors or, or, or anything obvious. But nothing's going to catch a compiler of, uh, you know, I'm referencing this object and it doesn't exist. You know, you don't capture that except through testing. So we certainly want to keep our business, we certainly can keep our business logic in JavaScript files. Um, a lot of the, the apps that I'm working with were calling um, APIs to return data and not do it. And the APIs aren't doing all that much business logic. The business logic is actually happening in the JavaScript. So if business logic is happening there, we, we do need a way to test if we're uh, you know, worried about test-driven development, as I certainly am. So obviously, that's where we're, what we're trying to do, um, when we're saying JavaScript is different, we're trying to keep the same things we've learned that, that work well in the, in the server-side world and bring them into this uh, HTML5 world. Because they work well, and let's, let's, let's continue doing the things that we do well in the software development world. So here, is how JavaScript can be similar. We still want to write tests first. We're doing test-driven design. We want our tests to uh, really drive how we're designing that application, uh, the JavaScript part of the application, because usually you're combining that with some other server-side uh, server uh, server type uh, programming languages. So we're going to write tests first. We're going to use abstraction for unit tests. So yeah, there, there's actually mocking uh, frameworks out there. I think JMock is one that you can use for your unit testing. So with your QUnit, if you don't want to, uh, you know, use your APIs right away, you know, maybe you leave your API, um, you're calling them APIs in your JavaScript for the integration testing. 
And for your unit tests, you abstract that to a mock object or something. So that's certainly something doable. So we, we do have some similar tools in the JavaScript world. We can calculate some code metrics. Um, there is some code coverage uh, within uh, Visual Studio, and to, especially TFS 2012. You, you can plug some of the key unit stuff using uh, something called Chutzpah, which we'll talk about later. And, and that can actually be integrated with the code metrics that come out of the box in Visual Studio, you know, based on the way they're doing their new frame, the new unit testing. They're, they're allowing you to use the unit testing framework that you want. So um, we won't get into that too much, but uh, <coughs> you, you certainly can calculate the code metrics. So let's, let's um, before, before we go here, let me, let me just show you what kind of code metrics are available. And, and these are the kinds of things that are really, um, they're, they're actually very helpful for you, whether you're using JavaScript or uh, in the C-sharp world. So if we look here, this, this is just coming standard with Visual Studio as well. I'm using the ultimate. So um, come standard with that, we, you know, cyclomatic complexity. That's, that's a uh, code metric that's, you know, people are, are starting to be uh, familiar with. And it's one that I think is very helpful. So if we look at uh, something that has a high cyclomatic complexity, uh, number, that's something we're going to want to investigate uh, in our design. Other things, you know, code coverage, we certainly want to get those metrics as well. Uh, and, and there's other ways to do that, but that's actually included as well here in Analyze. We can say, what's, what's our code coverage for this solution? All right, so... So now... There, there's a lot. There's a few different uh, unit testing frameworks out there for uh, JavaScript. I'm going to concentrate on a ch on two, and, and in particular, I'm going to concentrate on QUnit, the first one there. And I'll give you some uh, information at least on Jasmine and, and how you can use that as well. The the cool thing about the ALM tool that we're going to use is you can use QUnit or Jasmine or uh, a couple other frameworks uh, for your unit testing. So. Keep that in mind. Uh, I, I like QUnit. I just like the syntax. Um, it's it's very similar to some of the XUnit stuff that I'm used to, and and it integrates very well with uh, Visual Studio and on the Microsoft stack. Well, let's look into Jasmine, which is more of a behavior-driven development or behavior-driven design rather than test-driven design application. <coughs> so, excuse me. So BDD, if you're not familiar with that, is, is more of a scenario-based testing tool rather than a unit testing tool, which is more developer-focused. So our, our unit testing tool, QUnit, a, a developer is going to create unit tests that tests very small functionality uh, styles, if you will, functionality of the application. And, and, and they probably aren't going to show those unit tests to any stakeholders or product owners. However, with Jasmine or, or some of the other BDD styles, um, SpecFlow in the, in the uh, .NET world is one, and Cucumber is probably the most well-known uh, BDD, um, BDD framework out there, and that's for the Ruby folks. Uh, really, that those styles lend themselves to folks who aren't so technical being able to read uh, uh, the test, right? So they're, they're actually tests in English language, and they say, you know, this classic BDD um, syntax would be something like this. Given a scenario when I do something, then this result occurs. Uh, Jasmine isn't quite uh, that rigorous as far as the syntax it uses, but it's very similar in that it's doing a scenario and and it's very human readable, if you will, rather than programmer readable. Not that programmers aren't humans. Some people might disagree with me. Uh, the other thing with uh, Jasmine, of course, is it's Hutzpah supported, and that is pronounced Hutzpah. For a while I was pronouncing it Chutzpah and named when I heard it pronounced a different way. 
So as you can see, here is a sample of what a Jasmine unit test would be like. We've, we're describing the specification, and we're saying what the specification does, and then you're doing some code here. But uh, as I said, you know, maybe you could do this with comments in your unit test, but most people aren't going to do it. Uh, this kind of forces you to actually make things human readable. So uh, if you're a fan of that, and, and I certainly am, this might be a way to go. So that, so that you can show, it's something you can actually show uh, non-programmers when you want to run unit tests and say, hey, this unit test is passing, and they will understand what the unit test is actually for. So QUnit, um, QUnit is actually a test-driven uh, development style framework. So we, we are very similar to NUnit and XUnit frameworks use uh, equal to, to assert for past tests. So there, there's some very similar syntax there. It's similar in concept to how it works. Again, it's Hootspot supported. Um, QUnit, actually, there's a NuGet package you can uh, install in Visual Studio if you're using Visual Studio. So it's very easy uh, to get a hold of. And um, actually integrating it with your HTML and with your uh, JavaScript libraries it is fairly straightforward. So let, let's, let me just show you real quick how we actually create the unit test. So, um, so we're doing our, our uh, testing. One thing I do recommend is uh, a couple logistical uh, things before you actually the test is create a folder where you, you put the so, have, as we might in the in the uh, in the C sharp world, we're not going to really use spaces. I mean, you certainly could. It's just not as easy in our testing to uh, differentiate where the tests lie. So, I use folders and the actual name of the tests to to help out with that. So, under scripts, we might put tests. Uh, um, you know, uh, and and the and the other thing we might do is we might within the name of a test, we're going to have a, a, a syntax that we use. Uh, so it might be UT for unit test. It might be, um, you know, I would say INT for integration type tests. And, and for QUnit tests, you could even put QUT. Uh, the reason I do that is, I, in, especially in TFS, if I want to run tests, I can apply a filter that would say star dot, you know, qut.js, and that would run all my JavaScript tests. So, so that's pretty helpful, especially if you plan that up front. So I highly recommend you plan that up front and, um, you know, make sure the whole team is, is doing that consistently. So great. So we're, we're talking about that. As you can see, there's a sample of what the tests look like. This is a QUnit test. <laughs> we say test first, in parentheses, um, we, we enclose the test within parentheses and we give it a name, then we have a function after that, the, the name is for the function, and then we do our JavaScript within there, and we use equal to do the, our, our asserts. Now, when you first start out, you're going to want to... Uh, do that, you know, you're going to want to have a HTML uh, page to, to run this in. So, uh, I, <coughs> oh man, excuse me. I recommend just give me a second here. I'm going to open my, the folder here. But I recommend, um, you know, have, have at least a test page just to get, so you, you can see how the tests are working quickly. And when we get to that spot, you'll see that the, the, the also in your test explorer, but it's nice to have a, a couple different ways to see it. So as you'll see in my HTML page, um, pretty standard HTML, except we're going to link to the QUnits style sheet. Um, we're also going to have some headers that say <coughs> excuse me, what this test is doing. Then we link to the QUnit uh, JavaScript file library first. And then we uh, link to our tests first. So what happens 
before I run that. So let's uh, let's go down here. Let's just open that up here. Let's see what happens. So apparently, there's some blocked content here, and it's running. We're testing Hello World. <clears throat> And it's taking a long time, so I'm going to close that and let's run it. I, I didn't want to run it here because it's going to give me a lot of alerts. But let's do this. Uh, the other option is just view in the browser, right, in, uh, in Visual Studio. And so I'm going to say, okay, 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 something is really cached here because I didn't get rid of that. And now that we got through that, as you can see, this page says six tests of six pass, zero failed, and we show you what all is there. Um, you can drill in there to see what the different values are. So again, a pretty nice page you can have to help you with your tests. So that's all well and good, I'm sure. Uh, you're saying to yourself, uh, that's great, but, but we have a lot more than six tests, and I'm sure you do. So, so let's go on and let's talk about um, how we can do those different tests. So let's talk about, we, we, we know how to test. So when should we test? So uh, I mentioned how setting up those folders and, and I think you have a good idea of how you want to do that. So we certainly want to have at least a couple of types of tests. We want to have unit tests that are testing our functionality at a very low level and that they're driving the tests. And then we probably want to have some integration tests. Now you can do that a lot of different ways. You know, it's definitely a nice way to at least do some integration, uh, maybe taking your unit tests and having them go against the APIs rather than against a mock framework, for instance. So there's some different ways you can do that, but I, I would recommend having those different types of tests. Um, we want to make sure that we our, our integration points aren't failing for some reason programmatically, and we want to make sure that we run those integration tests at the right time. So we probably want to give the integration tests a different naming convention, so we run those on different builds than we would run our unit tests. Also, we want to maybe separate those into different folders, um, just so organizationally the team knows where things are. Also, we want to put the, the, the test the business logic in the JavaScript uh, layer. So that, that business logic might be that, you know, we might be testing login because we're using our JavaScript really to do the login because it's quicker and it goes against an API. So that might be some business logic we would throw in JavaScript or, or perhaps it's I'm changing the color on my screen and only certain people have access to do that. And again, we're doing that with JavaScript because of the speed, etc. And so we're going to have some business logic there and we want to test that. So those are the types of tests I would be running um, in that layer it, when they're not integration tests, when they're when they're unit tests. And also, if you're just creating everything in JavaScript, it, it makes sense that you're putting everything in those JavaScript files. So, so that's when I think we should use our, our unit tests, our JavaScript unit tests. So we have our JavaScript tests. Now we want to start building our JavaScript, right? We, we want to start building our application, maybe even deploying it somewhere at some point. And I certainly want to do that. So let's say uh, we want to do that. How do we integrate it into, say, TFS? So TFS 2012 uh, is really very extensible in a lot of ways to do this. But the nice thing is there's, a, there's an open source um, tool out there called Chutzpah. And that's really the secret to how you can implement that um, into your ALM strategy. So uh, I might as well just show you how, how that works. So Chutzpah, um, let me kind of 
close all these things up. But you'll notice that in my application, I, uh, in my solution, I have something called libs. And, and under there, you see a lot of chutzpah DLLs. And there's actually, this Phantom JS is actually uh, a headless, um, a headless browser to run your, your JavaScript tests. And that's kind of the key of how we want to do this, right? That, that's kind of the key of how we want uh, really to, to run our, um, our ALM here. So one of the things we need to do is we need to make sure our build, our build uh, controller, our build server knows where these are. So first thing we have to do, we set up Chutzpa somewhere in our source control. And then we make sure that uh, our build controller points to that. So if uh, those of you familiar with TFS, we should be able to go to manage build controllers. We go to our properties and we should see right there, we have a version control path to custom assembly. So we need to point that to where the chutzpah files are so that when we run our build and it runs the tests, it actually uh, has access to those DLLs. Another option would be to just install it on your build controller at a, at a place that makes sense to you. Um, this, this might be the easier way, and I would assume it's a recommended way. So, so that's one thing. That's how it's set up to actually do our testing um, within ALM. So now we've done that, how, how do we run our test? So let's, let's go back here, let's um, look at the build as I have set up. If you look, I have a CI demo. Um, let's just look at ran, hopefully in the last month, I think it's, it's done something. And we'll see here, uh, demos run. Build was successful, very good. I have a lot of warnings though, unfortunately. Um, need to work on that, right? But if we look at our log, we should be able to see some awesome tests. So we're looking at our tests, the build log file. Well, let me show you the definition itself. So if we go to edit build definition, and we go to process, Come up here soon. Hopefully. <laughs> As it downloads the uh, the custom assemblies, we're really going to look at the tests and how we're running them. Because everything is really integrated um, with TFS on, on the tool side, we're going to specify different types of tests. So, for instance, if I... Uh, have a different naming convention for my C sharp unit tests. I can I can put that filter in, and then if I have a different name for my um, my other uh, tests for my for my JavaScript the Q unit tests, uh, I can certainly do that. It seems to be taking a while to download the please. Um, so in those filters, I'm going to put uh, things like I think the, the naming convention I gave you was if I'm going to run an integration tab, my filter would be start int dot js, for instance. And my C sharps would be you know, star int dot cs if, if we follow that same naming convention on those different uh, products, on those different tests, I need to say. So well, let me see what's going on here. I'm going to close. And start over again because that seems to be taking way too long to download the custom assemblies. Hopefully, I'll be able to show you this. So, um, as we're doing this, the the main thing, you know, we we might have a continuous integration build, and that's where we're going to. The, that's a CI build, and that's. We wouldn't be doing any integration tests here. We won't be filtering for integration tests in this particular build. But for, say, a nightly build, we might be doing that. 
So, so keep that in mind as you're creating your builds. Um, it's it's one one way of really uh, making sure that the different tasks work at the different times. Because if you if you're going against like a live data store or you're going against a live websites in your CI builds, those are happening a lot more frequently than let's say your your nightly build. So your nightly build will have lots of times to build. But if your CI build is taking you know 10 or 15 minutes to run, um, you don't want to add that additional time um, of connecting to web servers and connecting to data stores to that CI build. So I'd run unit tests that are as quick as possible to keep that CI build very light and nimble. Well, I hate to shoot. This particular demo, seen, uh, part of the demo, uh, seems to not be behaving. So uh, I'll come back to that later. Let's see if there's anything else here I need to uh, talk to you about. Well, obviously, workspace, you know, you set the build up to go to your appropriate uh, source control folder. Um, but the process is really what we wanted to show you, unfortunately. Um, but basically, you, uh, you you would set it up in your process template to that to fail on uh, tests that to have your tests fail the build if the test didn't pass. The nice thing about this being integrated is there's some other uh, you have get a lot of quality information in TFS when, when you link your testing to to this uh, to your build. So, um, as you can see, you can assign quality to the builds, uh, and you can automatically do that as well. You can have it automatically happen as well. So, um, I've shown you how uh, Chetspa will integrate with this, and, and how you can integrate your builds in TFS. So now, let's talk a little bit. If you're not looking at TFS, you, you can utilize Jenkins. And let's see if here we go. I've got that open. Um, and I actually, I'll be honest with you, this was uh, kind of a last minute thing trying to show you how to do this in uh, Jenkins. But Jenkins is a uh, open source CI uh, build server. So that is something you can actually use as well. Uh, Jenkins. The way you would configure it. So let's see if I can um, remember where, where we're going to do this. You can actually, uh, at the end here, you could add a Windows command in Jenkins and, and use Chutzpa. Um, they have a command line. To, to run your tests in Jenkins, and that's the way I'd at least start out with, uh, but there's, there's probably other ways to do it as well. Um, unfortunately, I don't see uh, an add-in to Jenkins to, to run Chespa, but um, that's definitely one way you could do it with your team unit. So, so there are, this isn't just for TFS, you can use this in, in a lot of different environments. Right. Um, oh, one other thing I didn't mean to mention is Chespa also integrates well with Visual Studio so that you, sh you can see your JavaScript tests over here in your Test Explorer. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, so keep that in mind when you install that. You would install it uh, from here, and you go into your extensions and updates. Go online and search for Chespa. I already have that installed, but you want the Chespa. Uh, test adapter for 2012 installed, and uh, once you do that, it actually puts in, here if we go in our tools and options, hello, tools and options, you, you can see it adds a Chutzpah option, and there's Unit Test Explorer, and we can tell it what to test, HTML, just JavaScript, everything except JavaScript, uh, everything except HTML, or everything. So a lot of different options there. Uh, and, and once you build your solution, uh, they should show up over there in your, in your test explorer.
So while that's working, I'm going to hide that. And let's and and that's really how you integrate this with with your ALM solution. Um, once you fail, if you if you have if you have this integrated with ALM, this really is going to help your team uh, to to uh, deploy. So so if we pass, you know, you can use it to integrate with other tools. To, to run your deployments, uh, or, or you can just have it batch up whatever you have to deploy to a development environment or a QA environment. So, so your builds are pretty much the same. All you're really doing is you're changing your, um, your, 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 your changing your testing options and, and, and adding some additional testing options. Uh, really with Chutzpa and TFS, you're, you're making it a lot easier to hook into that uh, option. So let's go back here. We're actually getting pretty close to uh, the end. So um, I want to show you a few links here. Uh, the QUnit mocking test, uh, QUnit and Jasmine. So these are links. Oh, one other thing I do want to mention before we move on is uh, as to quality of tests, the thing that I, I have found really helps the quality of your test is to make sure that your scenarios that you're testing kind of jive with what the, the product owner or the stakeholder is, what they uh, want to test. So if you actually review your tests with uh, your, your, your somebody who's non-technical, who's really kind of running the project perhaps, or who you're doing the project with, you're going to get a lot of really great feedback on if that's a valid test, and uh, you're going to come up with some good quality tests as well. Now, obviously, people who are, are testing for a living, it's good to run it by them as well, the QA or, or tester types, so they can give you, um, you know, some negative things to test for. Uh, a lot of times as a developer, I know I don't, um, I always take the happy path, and a lot of developers have that, uh, that issue. So I, I strongly urge you to, uh, seek out wisdom if you if you don't know how to not take the happy path and, and get some other ideas on how to test for negatives to make sure it's going to fail when it should fail and um, and then it's giving you the appropriate responses so that's when we're start really starting to get into doing some really quality uh, quality automated unit testing and, and and I think as you do test room development you're really going to become uh, better at it and you're going to be your team is going to be able to do some really great uh, and, and high quality stuff uh, from their uh, applications so, so at this point that that's actually the end of it it's, I'm finishing a little early I guess um, so I don't know if there's any questions or if Dana if you have anything Thank you, Eric. That was a great presentation. Um, I'm just going to let the audience know they're muted right now, but if you do have a question for Eric, we'll be on the line for a few minutes. If you want to type it in the IM window, um, I can read it off to him, or I don't know if you're able to see the IM window, Eric. Um, I also just was going to see if you want to put your uh, email address in the IM window, because I am going to request control and put up a quick poll for the oh, audience. Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Once I figure out where to put that, I will do that. <coughs> here, I'll stop sharing. No. Oh, here we Great. Go. So I'm just putting up the first of four poll questions, and your feedback is valuable to us. So if you could take a moment to uh, answer these poll questions prior to logging out, we'd sure appreciate it. And as a reminder, you can request a copy of our slides uh, for the presenter today directly in the IM window or make a request to him via his email address at Agile Thought. If you want to put that in the IM window, if you get the chance, Eric, that would be great. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm a little trying uh, to. IM window challenged right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'll put it in there for you in just a minute. 
And I'd like to thank Microsoft partner Agile Thought and speaker Eric Landes for their presentation today. Agile Thought presents client-side intelligent design, when and how to use client-side test-driven design tools like QUnit and Jasmine while integrating them with ALM. Oh, here we go. Perfect. And that, thank you. I'll keep uh, toggling through these poll questions for a few minutes if you didn't get a chance to answer. Uh, but with that, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's online meeting. Thank you for joining us. And once you've finished the poll, you may now disconnect. Thanks. <laughs>